Good morning to all of you today. Thank you for coming to worship with us. We especially welcome those of you who are joining us online. Uh, we hope that you will participate with us in singing the songs and praying with us when it's time to pray uh, and uh, get your Bible out. Uh, we're going to be looking at uh, a continuation of a series of messages that we started last week called Tough Faith for Tough Times. Uh, would anybody agree that these are tough times that we're going through right now? Uh, if uh, if you, you've been awake for the last three or four months, then you know that they are. Uh, but we're glad that you've come to, to worship with us. Uh, we hope that you will, if there's anything that we can do, uh, please text welcome to that number at, on the, that's on the screen. Uh, and we'll be glad to be in touch with you this week. If there's a prayer need, if you'd like to visit with us, we'd be glad to talk with you. We're especially grateful for those of you that have been so faithful in giving uh, to our church's ministry during these days. Uh, you know, it's it, normally people come and just drop it in the offering plate, but many of you have started giving online. Uh, you've mailed your checks in. We just want to say thank you for that. Encourage uh, all of you, if you haven't set that up, to go ahead and do that as soon as possible. Uh, today we're going to be looking at uh, times of personal sorrow. There's a passage of scripture in Psalm 30 that I'd like to read to you, and then we'll begin our worship. It says, I extol you, O Lord, for you have lifted me up. You've not let your enemies rejoice over me. O Lord my God, I cried to you for help, and you healed me. Lord, you brought my soul up from shield. You've kept me alive. You've not allowed me to go down to the pit. Oh, sing praise to the Lord, you his godly ones. Give thanks to his holy name, for his anger is for a moment, but his favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may last for the night, but joy comes in the morning. We're here to celebrate that joy this morning. Father, we thank you for those that have joined with us. We pray, Father, that as we lift our hearts to you, you would receive our worship. And God, we would be changed because of your presence in our life. Help us to learn what tough faith is all about. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Uh, you guys join us in worship this morning.
never stop working, you never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you working. Even when I don't feel it, you working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Thank you. You can be seated, unless you'd rather stand up for the sermon. No, we're certainly glad to open God's Word again today. We began a, a series last week called Tough Faith. Uh, and you know, that song that we just finished, uh, that you're working even when we don't see you, uh, that was true last week when we saw when people disappoint us out of the life of Joseph. God was at work even when Joseph didn't see it. And we're going to see it again today that God is at work even when David didn't see it. And how many times have in your life you thought, does God even know what's going on in my life? And then all of a sudden, it looks like out of left field. Here comes God and he shows up and he said, you know, I had this thing all along. I don't know why you were worried about it. He does continue to work in our life. Last week we looked at when people disappoint you and all of us have been disappointed by folks in our lives. It could have been our parents, it could have been our kids, it could have been a spouse, it could have been your children, that we've just been disappointed when people fail us. And Joseph certainly experienced that. Today we're gonna to be looking at a second time when we need tough faith, and that is in times of personal sorrow and loss. I'll have to be honest with you, one of the toughest times of ministry is when people have gone through loss. What do you say? What do you do? Because you think, I, I feel so inadequate about trying to help in times like this. I, what are you going to say? Because life is filled with little sorrows as well as with large griefs. Uh, if you've ever been terminated from a job, then you know what it's like to feel grief. If you've ever left a place and moved to a new town and had to find uh, a, a, not, only, not only a new church, but a new uh, barber or hairdresser, a new doctors and dentist and things like that, it, it, is, it is a time of adjustment. When your kids grow up and go to college, I know some of you are thinking, oh, that will be a glorious day. Uh, but when they go, there is a loss. Um, had an economic downturn and financial stability went down with the economy. You break up with a boyfriend or a girlfriend. You don't make the team that you wanted to be on. You, you lost your health. You've, you've dealt with sickness. And certainly we've had enough of that sickness going around lately. You retire. It changes everything and it is a loss. Uh, have any of you ever lost a pet? 
You know, that's a tough loss. When you lose someone that uh, you've taken care of for 10 or 15 years, uh, loss of a family member, divorce, loss of a marriage, loss of a cherished dream that you've been hoping would come to fruition, the loss of a friendship, either because of uh, differences of opinion or because one of you moved, moved away. And some of you have known loss because of a traumatic event that has happened to you. It may have been a home invasion. It may have been an accident. It may have been uh, uh, an armed robbery. All of those things cause sorrow and loss in our life. And, and I came to realize early on as a pastor, man, there's nothing I could say to make that better. You, you know, what can you do? You've experienced those losses, or uh, if you haven't, you're going to. How we face those losses, I believe, is a measure of the focus of our lives and our faith. And I think ultimately will be a determiner of the success that you have in life. Some of the most successful people that our world has ever known have also gone through tremendous losses in their lives. And as we face sorrow and loss, we must have, and if we don't have it, we must develop a tough faith. If we're going to find strength and support and stamina and ultimately staying power in life. Today we're gonna to be looking at the life of one of the great biblical heroes, King David. His was a story of great glory, but also of great tragedy. Here was a shepherd boy that was named king of Israel and became the greatest king in Israel. He was honoring of King Saul even when King Saul tried to take his life. He was a valiant warrior, whether he was facing Goliath or one of the, uh, the armies of his enemies. He was, as the New Testament calls him, a man after God's own heart. Now, when, you, when it comes to your funeral, wouldn't you like it if people could truly say, you know, that person was a man or a woman after God's own heart, that, that they just walked with God. Here was David, great in every way, but David also sinned horribly before God. He committed adultery. He was guilty of murder. As a result, he lost the child that was conceived in the adultery. He later lost an adult son who led a rebellion to try to overthrow his kingdom. His daughter was raped by her stepbrother. And on and on and on. And so you look at David's life and you think, well, man, he knew the great things, but he also knew some tough times. Just because you're a king doesn't mean that you're immune from sorrow and loss. And I would hasten to say, just because you're a Christian does not mean that you won't experience sorrow and loss in your life as well. Just because you follow the Lord, those things will come in life and how you respond to it makes all the difference. This is a painful time in David's life and we're gonna see it uh, but how he moved so beautifully from overwhelming grief to a sense of acceptance and being able to move on. You know, grief and loss is not something that money can eliminate. It's not something that prestige can take away. It's something that we will all experience. What kind of faith will you face your sorrow and loss? If you have your Bibles, open with me to 2 Samuel chapter 12. 2 Samuel chapter 12. Let me set the background for this. In chapter 11 and chapter 12, these two chapters go together. In chapter 11, David has established his kingdom. He's defeated all the enemies that are around him. And so when it comes time to, to take on some other enemies, David says, General Joab, you go out and handle it. I'm just going to, I'm going to hang around the house. And instead of being where he needed to be, he had time on his hands, and what do they say about idle mind and idle time is the devil's workshop? Well, that's where he first saw Bathsheba, and he sent for her, he committed adultery with her, and 
just not long after that, she communicated with him and said, guess what? I'm expecting a child and it's your baby. David said, how can I cover this up? I'm the king. Surely I've got ways to cover it up. So he sent for her husband who was at war on the battlefield. And he said, well, I'll just send him home and he'll sleep with his wife and people will never know the difference because they didn't have DNA back then. And so he came home and Uriah, being the, the, the soldier that he was, he refused to go home and sleep with his wife because he said, all of my friends are out in the, on the battlefield. And so David thought, okay, what am I gonna do? And so he sent to General Joab and said, put Uriah out in the front of the battle and then fall back and he'll be killed. So David was guilty of planning Uriah's murder. And then when Uriah died, he took Bathsheba as his wife. And then he thought, okay, it's covered. You know, everything's gonna be okay. And then one day, a prophet of God came. His name was Nathan. And he told David a parable about a man who had all the sheep and all the herds and then one man who all he had was one pet sheep. And the man that had everything took the one sheep that belonged to the man and killed it. And Nathan said, what do you think you ought to do to somebody like that? And David said, huh. he was incensed. How could he do that? Nathan pointed that bony finger at David and said, you're the man that did that. And David just wilted. Nathan pronounced God's judgment upon him and saying that his sin had been forgiven, but the child would die and that the sword would never leave his home. And it didn't. And that's where we come in chapter 12 of 2 Samuel, beginning in verse 15. Today, as we look at how we can have tough faith in the times of sorrow and loss, look with me, if you will. The scripture says, Then the Lord struck the child that Uriah's widow bore to David, so that he was very sick. And David therefore inquired of God for the child. David fasted and went and laid all night on the ground. And the elders of the house stood beside him in order to raise him up from the ground because he was unwilling and would not eat food with them. Then it happened on the seventh day that the child died. The servants of David were afraid to tell him the child was dead. They said, behold, while the child was alive, we spoke to him and he did not listen to our voice. How can we tell him that the child is dead? He might do himself harm. David, when he saw that his servants were whispering together, David perceived that the child was dead. And so David said to his servants, is the child dead? And they said, he is. So David arose from the ground, washed, anointed himself, and changed his clothes. And so he came into the house of the Lord and worshiped. And then he came to his own house, and when he had requested, they set food before him, and he ate. And then his servants said to him, what is this thing that you've done? While the child was alive, you fasted and wept, but when the child died, you arose and ate food? And he said, while the child was alive, I fasted and wept, for I said, who knows? The Lord may be gracious to me that the child would live. But now he has died, why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I will go to him, but he will not return to me. That is a reminder of death. We can see them later, but they're not coming back. We're going to have to go ahead to meet them. Now I want us to kind of divide this, this study up in two sections. Because some of you are here and you're going through sorrow right now. It's uncertain how it's going to turn out. You may have someone who's sick, someone who's at the point of death. You, you may know or not know about whether you're going to lose a job. You know, all different kinds of scenarios. And you're in the middle of it. And then some of the rest of us either have just come through it or it's been at an end and we're kind of at loose ends to see how it's going to work in our life. And so what we're going to do is look at what's our attitude? What can we learn from David when we're going through it? And then how do we respond to it when it's over? One of the greatest frustrations of sorrow is, 
is not only our praying and how to pray. Uh, have you ever, have you ever, like, had someone that was sick? It may be your child, or it may be your parent, and and you know you pray. I mean, you really. I mean, it's not one of those now lay me down to sleep prayers. This is one of those God help me prayers. And it seems like the more you pray, it's like God is silent. You don't. You're expecting. You're wanting God to say, "Got this. Get out of the way. It's going to be all right." And you don't hear anything from Him. We're looking at the seriousness of the condition. We're looking at the urgency of the time frame. We're looking at the helplessness that we have. And now God doesn't say a word. This is a time for tough faith. David certainly reflected that in his life. There are three things that we're going to see in the midst of our sorrow. The first one is this. It is a prayerfulness because even though God is silent, it doesn't mean that your prayers are futile. God is at work. And it says in verse 16 that David kept on inquiring of the Lord. The word inquiring is a word for praying. It has the root word to seek. It has the sense of being able to consult and say, God, just let's talk about this. And in some cases it is used with the word beg. Now, I'll be honest with you, and some of you would agree with me, there are times in our lives that we are begging God to do something. We're begging God to heal somebody. We're begging God to, to keep this event that looks like a tragedy from happening. We're begging for God to do it. David heard the prophecy of Nathan saying that this child is going to die but that didn't cause David to give up in resignation. He cried out to God all the more. And the reason why is we need to understand the basic presuppositions of prayer. The basic assumptions of prayer is that God is a good God. God's loving, he's merciful, he's gracious. And who knows, God may hear. The second thing, presupposition of, of prayer, is that this, God loves his children. And he hears the prayers of his children. And so when you and I who know him and trust him cry out to him, we know he hears our prayer. And so our prayer is not futile. And so that's what David thought. It, God loves me. God's gracious. God's going to hear me. So I'm going to pray even though I've gotten the word that the child is going to die. We're reminded that in times of sorrow and loss, it ought to drive us not to resignation, not to despair, but to prayer. When you hear the report of the doctor and it's not good, when you get the word from your boss and it's not what you wanted, when that one that you've depended on fails you, don't give up on your praying. We can recount the number of times that God has heard our prayers and answered them miraculously. And the reason why is because prayer does something that we, we don't focus on enough, and that is this. We, we think that prayer focusing on getting God to either act the way we want him to or to change his mind to do something that maybe he's not planning to do. But see, what God wants to do first and foremost with prayer, he wants to change you and me to make us like we ought to be. And then he will use his answer in order to fortify and to verify that. Prayer changes you before it ever changes the circumstances that you face. Prayerfulness. The second thing that we see is an earnestness. David fasted. The baby lay hanging in the balance of life for seven days, so we're assuming that for seven days David fasted. And that fasting was a picture of his sincerity and his brokenness and his earnestness in his praying. He was so focused on his prayers that he didn't even care for food. Now, fasting is more than just going without food. Fasting is a spiritual discipline where it changes our focus to God 
and communion with Him, and that takes precedence over just the normal things of life, like eating. God, I'm so focused, I'm so zeroed in on you that I, I don't really care about food. Most of the time that doesn't happen. But in times of sorrow and loss, when we're going through the midst of those uncertainties, we're earnest with God. We say, God, you know, I'll, I'll do whatever it takes. And we're so focused on that that God demands our attention. Jesus gave us some instruction about fasting. He didn't say if you fast. He said when you fast in Matthew chapter 6, verses 16 through 18. Fasting recognizes the priority of the spiritual over the temporal, the need of the moment over what we would think would be the essentials of our life. So the question that we really need to ask ourselves is that how earnest are you with God in a time of loss? I mean, do you, do you really think that God's going to do something, that God can do something, that God wants to do something that you hadn't planned on? Fasting shows that we mean business with God. Now, it's no guarantee that God's going to give us what we ask for but we know that he will hear us. James reminds us that the fervent effectual prayer of a righteous man avails much. I had to ask myself this question. You know, I have to be honest with you. As I was developing this sermon, I asked myself a lot of questions and I was not real pleased with some of the answers. The question I asked here at this point was, when was the last time that seeking God was more important to you than eating? Third thing, prayerfulness, earnestness, and then a submissiveness. David laid on the ground. It's a picture. Now, this is the king, the king of Israel, laying on the ground. It's, it's a picture of the depth of his contrition, of his humility, of his seeking God. He stepped off of his throne that he could rightly sit on, and he just fell on his face before God. It's a picture of our nothingness in light of God's sovereignty. It's a symbol of David saying, God, I want what you want more than I want what I want. Didn't Jesus say that in the Garden of Gethsemane when he prayed, Father, not my will, but yours be done. Whatever comes, Lord, I surrender to you and to your will. It's that confession that God's purposes and plans are greater than my perception of what things ought to be. My dad died in 1989. We got word that uh, he'd had a stroke. Uh, I was living in West Texas at the time and on Saturday, and so right after Sunday morning service, we made our way to Denison where he was in the hospital. Uh, he'd had a stroke, and as oftentimes happened with stroke victims, the, the stroke deepens as it goes along. And so his cognitive ability, uh, where he could at first speak some and then he could write some, all of that was, was diminishing by the time I got there. And so two nights before he died, I had the privilege and the honor of staying the night with him in the hospital. I can remember seeing him as he was, seeing him as, as, he, as he was there, but I'd remember just a few days before, a man full of life, who had uh, uh, full of plans for retirement, and mom retiring, and they loved to travel, and so, and I, I thought about all of those losses. And, and as I watched and prayed for him that night, I came to the point of saying, God, you know what I want. You know what our family wants. But God, ultimately, we want what you want. So, Lord, whatever you want, it's okay. To pray such a prayer is not an abandonment of faith. 
I believe it's the strongest expression that you could ever have of faith. Where you say, God, you know best. I think I know what I want. I think what I want is best. But God, I confess you know more than I do. And so God, I'm trusting you regardless of my personal preferences or desires. And in the midst of grief and loss, sometimes we get confused about what God wants versus what we want. And this submissiveness says, God, it's your will that we want done. It's always God's will that we pray. And we know that when we pray, God's will is always best for us. We may not understand it at the time. We may not want it at the time. But God always comes through. So prayerfulness and earnestness and submission. If you show these qualities, God will help your tough faith make it through. That's how he did. And I'm here to give testimony of that. Well, what happened in David's case was even though he prayed, fasted, was earnest and was submissive to God, the child died. And when we face death like that, you know, there's lots of things that have been written about the process of grieving. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, you know, almost 50 years ago, did a study on death and dying and applied those principles of people that were terminally ill, ter, uh, terminally ill and how that applies to the grieving process as well. And so we know that. We know about denial, that uh, in the first that there's a state of shock and, and denial and we're, we're kind of numb. You know, we go on, but we really don't feel what we're going through at the time. And it's, uh, it's just a way for us to get by. But what happens with that denial, the reality of death begins to sink in. And our response oftentimes is a reaction. It's anger. And we get angry. And anger expresses itself in lots of different emotions. It doesn't have any limits. It can extend to the doctors and the medical staff that were taking care of your loved one. It can extend to family or friends that maybe didn't get them to the the doctor soon enough. It can be to the loved one, why could you do this to me and leave me here with four squalling kids? I I, I don't know. Where's God in all of this? And underneath that anger though, is the pain of loss. And all of us sense that. And then from there, it moves to to a sense of bargaining. You know, while they were going through the loss, you'd say, God, I'll be a missionary in Africa if you'll just heal my my loved one. You know, just, just make them better. But then after they pass, you think, God, I'll do anything for you to take the pain away. Just anything. Because it hurts so bad. Then... When that doesn't change, the person's still gone. Many times people sink into a depression. And it goes deeper than anything that we could have ever imagined. We sometimes think we'll never get out of it. We want to just crawl into a hole and pull the earth over us. But then over time, with prayerfulness, earnestness, and submission, we begin to move toward acceptance. Now, acceptance, I don't want to confuse, acceptance doesn't mean that you're ever going to be okay with what happened. It's not, that loss is there and it's hurt, and it's hurtful and it's painful. There will always be a sense of loss. But acceptance allows you and me to come to the point of saying, God, my loved one has died and I don't like it. But I know that my life has meaning beyond this. And I'm willing to accept this reality for my life. And we learn to live with it. It is a new norm. But where there are lots, there's lots of studies about the stages of grief, I've never seen any study on the power to get you through grief. You see, you know you're going to go through the stages, but how do you get through those stages? 
What is the force? What is the strength? What is the, the wisdom? What is the power to get us through? And I believe that that is a tough faith that gets you through. David demonstrated this tough faith throughout this ordeal. When the child was still alive, we saw what he did. But when the child died, he didn't give up that tough faith. I found and you found sorrow either deepens a person in their walk with God or it destroys a person in their walk with God. And while the scriptures don't specifically deal with the stages, they point out steps that we can take to find power in the loss that we face. And it's a, you have to understand that you're dealing with a whole ball of feelings over here in grief. But God wants you not to stay in the realm of feelings. He wants you to move to the stage of acting because that's what tough faith does. Tough faith believes it's so when it's not so, so that it will be so. Faith moves you from inaction to action. And so if we're going to get through it, then we have to understand this basic principle. And I've used it in biblical counseling all of my ministry. It's easier to act your way into a new way of feeling than it is to feel your way into a new way of acting. Most people think when I feel better, then I'll act better. The Bible teaches that faith is acting like you should and then your feelings will later follow. And let's see this in, in six things that Jesus, uh, that, that David did in the midst of his sorrow. The first thing they did is found in verse 20. It said, David arose from the ground. Get up. Just get up. Grieving is always intended to be temporary, not permanent. The typical period of mourning for Moses and Aaron and for other great leaders was 30 days. Now, we know that the pain of loss is not over in 30 days, but it is a reminder that God doesn't want us to stay in our grief. It's time to get up and get going. We have a tendency in times of loss to withdraw from friends and activities. Too many people want to crawl into a hole or pull the covers over their head. They feel like that they would dishonor the person if they got back and got out very soon. Now, I want to just, let's just pose this. How many of you... If you were to die today, you would want your family to just stay in and not do anything in mourning your loss. Well, you'd want them to be sad for a day or two or a minute or two. But none of us want those people that we love to be debilitated by the loss that, that they would feel with us. And the person that you have lost doesn't want that for you either. So it's time to get up. Make the choice to get up. Don't stay down too long. The second thing that David did, he washed and anointed himself. Clean up. People didn't wash themselves during the time of mourning. David evidently had been in mourning for about seven days and he hadn't cleaned himself up. It was time to get up and to clean up. Having a clean body doesn't do anything spiritual, but it does everything psychological just to make you feel better. It's a reminder that during this grief, just like the, the water washes your body down, you can wash that grief away. So you clean up. The third thing that you do, he says he changed his clothes. So dress up. In the Old Testament time, morning clothes were back, black, coarse uh, fabric that there were symbols of mourning. They were sticky and so they reminded you of the pain that you were going through. But those were typically worn for a season and they were to throw off the clothes of mourning and put on the clothes of joy. In modern times, people wear black, particularly women. Men sometimes wear a black armband, but it's time to dress up. It's time to change. And when we change the way we dress, it changes our attitude as well. So you dress, dressing is a statement that you yourself are not going to let grief control you forever. The fourth thing that David did is when he came to his own house, when he requested, they set food before him and he ate. I like to, wanted to come up with something better than this, so I just said eat up. Don't be afraid to eat. After the time of fasting is a time to break the fast. It's time 
Uh, grief takes a toll on our appetites, and when we don't eat the way we should, it depletes the body of nourishment and energy, and so it's time to just eat. When Elijah was going through his time of great depression, God fed him, reminded him, and he said, eat it. I put it here for you. The fifth thing, and this is really important, it's to speak up. You remember when the child was not yet dead, David didn't want to talk to anybody. But when the child died, then all of a sudden, his, his, his servants wondered, what's going on here? Before, you didn't want anybody to talk to you, and now you're getting up and you're, you, you've put on your clothes, you've, you've eaten, you, you've done all of this. And David clearly expressed what he was going through. He said, while the child was alive, I fasted and wept. For I said, who knows, the Lord may be gracious to me that the child may live. So David began to talk about the loss. It's important that we talk about the losses in our life. We don't bottle them up on the inside. That's why friends and family are so helpful in dealing with grief. You talk it out. Now, some of the rest of us are saying, well, you know, I'm afraid to bring it up because I'm afraid they'll cry. Well, they're crying anyway. So just talk to them about it. It will make them know that you know and that you care and that you miss them as well. It will enhance the honor and the memories, not take away from them. The last thing, and I think the most important thing that David did, was he looked up and he came into the house of the Lord and worshiped. Worshiping God is the best therapy you can ever have for dealing with grief. Whether it's a small loss, or a large grief. Don't neglect the worship of God. It was not a resignation. It was a recognition that God is still there. He's still on his throne. He has control of my life and he's going to get me through it. It reminded David that God is the one that holds the power of life, both temporal life and eternal life. I can't bring him back to me, but one day... I will go to him. See, that's the hope that we have as believers, is that when someone that we love is, that dies and we know that they're a believer, it's a temporary separation. And yes, we have separation anxiety, but ultimately, we're going to see him again. To worship God is the key to victory and to restoration. It's been such a joy over the years as I've seen Christian families that have buried a loved one through the week and the very next Sunday morning they're in worship when my dad died as I recall I think we buried him on a Friday and our family our entire family was in worship on Sunday morning and uh, I said why are you here and the thought is where else would we be but in the presence of God. Because you see, it recognizes that God is the one who gets us through. It's tough faith in Him gets us through this tough time in life. Worship puts life back into perspective. It's a reminder that yes, this was a loss, and yes, this was grievous, and yes, this is temporary. But there's more to life than just this puts life back into perspective. It puts the world back into perspective because grief and loss sometimes debilitate people in the world. But for the believer, it's a temporary season. We have the power to overcome it. You see, when we look up, it makes all the difference. So many of you are here today and probably you're all dealing with some kind of loss. Small loss, maybe a move, maybe school's not starting or maybe school is starting. There's a loss that all of us feel. Has it drawn you to God or has it kept you away from God? These steps that we just talked about 
are steps that will allow you to draw into Him, to lean in on God, to have that tough faith. And a God-focused faith is always going to get you through. When we turn to Him in times of loss, we know that He will never fail us. There's an old hymn that we used to sing. It's called, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. It says, O soul, are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see. There's light for a look at the Savior and life more abundant and free. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in His wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. Tough faith gets us through the tough time of sorrow and loss. And I call you, I encourage you, I beg you to find that tough faith in Jesus. Would you bow with me as we pray? Father, we're grateful for a faith that sustains us in times of loss. And God, for those who are going through loss, I pray that our hearts would be drawn to you instead of the circumstances that are around us. Because God, when we come to you, we know you will never fail us. And God, we know you will give us the grace and the strength and the courage to get through. So Lord, we give that problem, that loss, that grief to you today, knowing that when we receive you, you're all we need. For those who are here, for those that are listening, that are facing grief and loss, Lord, if they would just contact us, we'd be glad to to pray with them, to talk with them, to spend whatever time we need to, to point them to the God who is greater than our greatest need. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
death was arrested, my life began. Ash was redeemed, only beauty remains. My orphan heart was given.